Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala tammani li akmalani khayr khalqillah wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Allahumma allimna bima yanfa'una wa anfa'una bima allamtana wa zidna ilman ya kareem. Rabbi shurah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa ahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli thumma amma ba'd. Brothers and sisters, the first thing that I observe is that this year I see there are so much more of you here, mashaAllah. May Allah Azza wa Jal reward all of you for being here. Secondly, there's just one small retraction that I want to make with the introduction. Um, my parents are Guyanese. I've got lots of Trini family. But I'm neither, I don't consider myself Guyanese or even Trinidadian. I was actually born in Saudi Arabia and lived my whole life right in Toronto, Canada. So even if you're sitting at home there and you're making nice doubles or bus up shut for me, I might still prefer burgers and fries. Okay? Yalla. Today, insha'Allah ta'ala, what I want to share with all of you is actually something very special. Something that is extremely important and dear to all of us. It is a hadith of our messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. It is a beautiful hadith and I'm sure many of you sitting in this audience, you have heard this hadith many times. In where our messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he addressed a group of people. They weren't necessarily companions, but a group of people when he entered Medina. And this is the hadith that is called Hadith of Salam. Everybody with me? So it's called Hadith of Salam. This hadith is called the hadith of peace because of a number of different reasons. But primarily it's because of the man who narrated the hadith. His name was Abdullah ibn Salam. Abdullah ibn Salam radiallahu an. I'll tell you a little bit about what's happening here. When the Prophet ﷺ is about to enter Medina, remember at that time almost all of Medina was not Muslim. Only about 20% or maybe less of Medina was actually Muslims. The rest belonged to other faiths, Christians and Jews and so on. So when he's coming into Medina, there was a rabbi, there was a rabbi that came at the entrance of Medina and he heard about this man called Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He heard about him. So he wanted to meet who this man was. And as soon as he saw the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasalam, the first thing that this rabbi says, he says, Wallahi, when I look at the face of this man, I know for a fact that he cannot be a liar. SubhanAllah. I want you to just think for a minute. This man, this rabbi, he saw the blessed face, the most beautiful face, a face that was more beautiful than the full moon. And he only looked at his face and he says, this man cannot be a liar. And subhanAllah, brothers and sisters, this kind of teaches something to you and I about the effects of faith and iman in our hearts and in our lives. Even if you don't say a word, people will still see beauty in your action. Even if you don't move and you just stand there, you stand with tranquility, you stand with peace. You don't have a swag in the way that you walk, in the way that you talk, in the way that you stand. You stand with a sense of humility. So our messenger alayhi salatu wasalam was this kind of person that you could look at him and you can see honesty dressed all over his character and he didn't even have to say a single word. So eventually later on, as he enters Medina, the Prophet sallallahu looks at the people and this is what he says, Ayyuhan nas, O people. So this hadith, you see earlier before salah, you just heard a brief few minutes about giving da'wah. About giving da'wah. I just told you that uh, 
your character, your image, the way you dress, the way you talk, the way you carry yourself, the way you behave is the strongest voice you have. People always say, can you give me techniques of how to give da'wah? I don't have any te techniques that you should use for da'wah. The Qur'an actually doesn't give you specialized techniques for da'wah. It gives you guidelines. Whatever it is that you're doing, here are the guidelines you need to stick with. This is why Allah says in the Qur'an that you need to call with wisdom. Udru ila sabili rabbik bil hikmah. Come and call people to this religion using wisdom. He doesn't say knowledge. He says use your head. Think about the right time to say the right things at the right place. Don't just use any opportunity and walk to somebody on the street and be like, Hey, you come here. Let me tell you about Islam. Do you know what the Quran is? Here's the Quran. Go and read it. This is what Allah says. Are you atheist? Are you this? Are you that? And you start tackling that individual. Can I ask you something? And you answer for yourself. How many people do you know are actually receptive to that kind of information? How many people do you know when you sit there and you attack their current situation, you attack their current position, religion, whatever their belief system is, you go after it and you show all the flaws in that particular religion. How receptive are they to say to you, well, you know what? You've just insulted the thing that I've been practicing my whole life, so thank you, now I want to be Muslim. It doesn't happen as easy as you think it does. So Allah Azza wa Jal in Quran teaches you that the first thing you need to do if you want to call people to religion is SubhanAllah, you got to be a good person. You got to be able to talk in a polite, respective, courteous manner. And so the Prophet وسلم, the first thing that he says to these people is Ayyuhan Nas. He doesn't say people. He doesn't say all of you. He calls them Ayyuha. You know how you hear in Quran, Ya Ayyuhan Nas, Ya Ayyuhan Ladina Amanu. This term Ayyuha is a very respective term. It's a term of honor and dignity. It's the thing that this is how Allah addresses you. That even though we are His creation, Allah still loves and respects us as a creation. He molded us, He fashioned us, but He still loves us. He doesn't talk to us in a harsh manner unless we put ourselves in bad situations, unless we fall in the gutter. We do the things, we disobey Him, then Allah will be shadeed, then Allah will be firm. So the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, he's talking to these people and he says, Ayyuhan nas. O oh people, O oh people that I respect as human beings, I need you to listen up. Here's one thing that I want you to know. Does everybody know what is the Arabic word for people or human beings? Insan, right? The Arabic word for people is insan. Insan comes from the word nesia. Nesia means to forget. So by default, what kind of creation are we? We are a creation that always forgets. That's why you always need reminders after reminders. You have to have reminders on your cell phone to pray, to go to the marketplace, to do certain duties, to make sure there's an exam tomorrow, don't forget, you have a meeting, you gotta go pick the kids up from school at a particular time, you gotta go drop them off, you gotta do all of these routines and you constantly need reminders. So ayyuha al-ahbab, my beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, I want you to understand our nature. Our nature, we are people that constantly forget. And how you counter that is you need to be constantly reminded. That's why Allah called Quran dhikr. He called this book the book of remembrance. This is the book that you constantly need to connect to because you're going to keep forgetting. This is why Allah says, I need you to pray five times a day. And He told Musa alayhi salam the same thing. Pray 
establish salah so you don't forget me because the moment you stop praying or you only pray four times a day or three times a day then guess what's gonna happen it's inevitable by default you will eventually forget Allah and if you don't forget him completely you'll have a part-time relationship with him you know what a part-time relationship of Allah looks like you'll only remember him on Jum'ah day you'll only remember him at a conference You'll only remember him when you're in salah. You'll only remember him when you're with religious figures. So you are not necessarily a devoted individual. But when you're around other hijabis, then you will pull out your hijab as well. When you're, allow, when you're around others that have, you know, mashallah, they're talking about Allah, then you want to suddenly get into that spectrum and start having those same conversations. When you're not in that, you may end up being guilty of having the filthiest tongue anybody has ever heard. All of this goes back to that phenomenon. You are stuck. This individual is stuck in a part-time relationship with Allah because their salah is bankrupt, their remembrance with Allah is bankrupt. So, ayyuhan nas, O people who constantly forget, listen to this hadith. I'm going to give you four things in this hadith. This hadith is what I like to call the summarization of Islam. If you want to summarize Islam into four words, into four things, this hadith will teach you. If you want to summarize your purpose in life in four sentences, then you go into the Quran in Surah Al-Asr. So now I'll give you four things from our Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. He tells us, Ayyuhan nas, number one, afshu salam, spread the salam. Number two, wa tut'imu ta'am and feed those who are in need. Number three, وَصِلُ arham, and keep family ties strong with each other. وَصَلُّوا بِاللَّيْلِ وَالنَّاسُ نِيَامِ Here's number four, pray during the nights while other people, they are sleeping. It's talking about tahajjud, qiyamul layl. So four things, I'm gonna go through all four of them with you. Number one was what? Afshu salam, spread the salam. Here's the problem. You know when I tell you about spreading the salam, a lot of people they say, well that's easy. All I have to do is just walk around, salam alaikum, salam alaikum, salam alaikum. Or in some dialects, salikum, salikum. Other languages, slams, sal. <laughs> All kinds of different versions. All you got to do is just say salam. The conclusion of the hadith I didn't give you. The Prophet ﷺ says, I want you to do four things. The conclusion of the hadith I didn't give you yet. The last sentence in the hadith it says, Tadhulul Jannata bis salam. You will enter Jannah with salam, with peace. So you're telling me that all you have to do is do these four things and you waltz into Jannah that easily? Well, let's see. This hadith is actually giving you a gateway to other things that are far deeper and far more crucial in our lives. When you say salamu alaykum to somebody, you know what you're doing? You're actually calling upon Allah who is as-salam. And you are asking As-Salam to send down Salam in this Salam that you give to this other individual. You're asking As-Salam, the source of peace and security, send down your peace and security through this Salam that I give this individual so they will have your peace and security. So when you have that kind of mentality when you say Salam to somebody, then let me ask you, would you ever harm somebody like that? Would you ever curse at them? Would you ever swear at them? Would you ever backbite them? It is an absolute shame on somebody who says salamu alaykum to somebody, but then he will be the first person to slander him. He'll be the first person to backbite him. This is what I call the salam of a hypocrite, of a munafiq. This is the first thing you say salamu alaykum, you see them and you're like, oh gosh, what's she wearing? Oh, 
She's wearing the same outfit that I'm wearing. And then she comes by, Assalamu alaikum, how are you doing? You look so beautiful. And in, the, in, in your mind, you're cursing her. You're like, oh God, I hope she walks into that wall. Hmm. Or what happens so often, if we don't agree on an Islamic issue, what happens? We split. Our, and I say, when I, when I say our, we, as a Muslim culture, our bad habits cause us, our pride, our ego causes us that if we can't agree on basic things, we split. We walk away from one another. And if you go into somebody else's masjid, what's the first thing that happens? Assalamu alaikum, brother. MashaAllah, I'm so happy with the work you guys are doing. But in the back of your mind, I hope that this place falls apart. I hope that this place has no success. I hope this organization plunders. But you see the ones who are in charge, Salaamu Alaikum, you shake their hands and you walk away, SubhanAllah. This is what scholars call the Salam of a Munafiq, the Salam of a hypocrite. May Allah Azza wa Jal protect us from that. Say Ameen. Ameen. So our Messenger Alayhi Salatu Wasalam, the first thing that he says is Afshu Salam. Spread the Salam. You know myself and Sheikh uh, Mufti Mink, we have such a blessed opportunity that we get to walk around. Later on, we're going to walk around all through the stalls. And we'll give hundreds and thousands of salams to all of you. Now, we know why we give salams. You know why you give salams. But in your heart, I want you to always keep in mind the deeper need. Don't come to us and give us salams just because you want selfies with us, just because you want to meet us for, you know, because you saw us on TV, you saw us on YouTube. Oh my God, there he is. Oh my God, he actually walks. Wow, mashallah, I saw him. He's actually drinking water too, subhanAllah. We're just regular guys. Believe me, we're just regular people do regular things. We are more happy to meet you than you are to us. Wallahi, that is the truth. We are more privileged to be here and sit and stand and be amongst all of you because nothing brought us here except you all. Except for the sake of Allah, we wanted to meet the Muslims in this part of the world. So when you come and you say salams to us, make that salam come from your heart and make that salam be like a personal specialized dua from your heart that you ask as salam to send down his salam for the both of us. Everybody's going to remember that? So when I meet all of you, inshallah, and you come and you want to say salam, this is how our salam should be. And when you have that kind of mentality, subhanallah, are we going to ever have any problems in our culture, in our society, in our communities, in our families? Imagine if that was the kind of salam we had. Would we ever have any problems? Subhanallah. So that's the first thing. Now, the salam, and then I move on. I want to conclude the salam and say to you, this is what I call the ultimate icebreaker. Salam is the door towards good manners. It's the door towards good etiquettes. So once you achieve that, now you can go on to number two. Number two, الطعام, And feed those who are in need. This is number two. So you've already broken the ice. You've opened the gateway towards being good. You are not allowed to just talk the talk. You have to walk the walk. Now you got to put your life into action. So you cannot tell me that you love Allah and you love His religion. You love Islam. Yet you don't pray. Yet you don't want to follow His commands. Yet they're still bickering and fighting. Yet in your homes, in our marriages and so on, we can't fulfill each other's rights. Yet we still have a bankrupt soul in our hearts. This doesn't reflect our love for Allah or neither His Messenger والسلام, So you have to now look at yourself. You love Him, Alhamdulillah. But now you have to look at your life and see if your life reflects if you love Him or not. You know how many Muslims, they use the term sunnah? They say, I have to practice the sunnah. I want to tell you something about this term here for a moment. Earlier on in January in Toronto, and by the way, if you've never been in a country with winter, <laughs> come to Toronto. 
and come around mid-January, early February. So you'll enjoy beautiful minus 45 degrees, sometimes even minus 35 degrees. It is so cold. I feel like it's haram to go outside, how cold it is. It is brutal. And I remember one, day, one night we were in this deep freeze for about one week where it was minus 35 and 40. I went to work, I went to the masjid, and a brother comes in, and if you see him, he was like this. And he couldn't, even, he couldn't even put his hands together. He was literally freezing and shivering. And he walks into the masjid. So I look at him and I said, it's a nice day for a picnic, huh? So he's, he grins, but he says, man, I'm freezing. I looked at what he was wearing. You know what he was wearing? The same garment that I'm wearing. He was wearing a thobe. And the thobe was really short so you could see the skin on his legs. He didn't even have high socks on. So I could see that his, the skin and the color of his legs. So I say, bro, what are you wearing, man? And it's that cold outside. You know what he said to me? Achi, I gotta follow the sunnah. And I said to him, bro, that's not the sunnah, man. That's crazy what you're doing. That's not sunnah, man. And this is the problem. So many Muslims are guilty of restricting sunnah to just a habit. A habit where I dress a certain way or I talk a certain way and somehow I have achieved sunnah. In one sentence, sunnah is not a particular practice, it's a lifestyle. Sunnah is a lifestyle. You have to change things in your life. Put things in or take things out. Then you start achieving the lifestyle of what sunnah is. So when we say that we need to practice the sunnah of our messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, you know what you're really saying? I want my life to be lived like that man. So if you go to your house now and you got pictures of people hanging on your walls and our messenger alayhi salatu wasalam told us that if you display images of living things, display images of living things in your home, then angels will not come in your house. Now you have a choice to make. Do you want the lifestyle of living in sunnah or do you want to just pick and choose? And so we hope and we pray that we can be of the first category. Our lifestyle reflects that. So coming back to the hadith, تُطْعِمُ الطَّعَامِ Be people who are in need. This organization, ROU, has that Feed the Needy program. This is why that program is so crucial. It, sp it specifically targets people who are in need in all aspects, but especially with food. What is the one thing that every human being needs for survival's sake? Forget about religion, forget about background. All of us need food to survive. So the Prophet ﷺ says, Look, make sure that all of you are able to sustain yourself and you get a comfortable meal. In another hadith, he says, Wallahi, thumma wallahi, thumma wallahi. He says, By Allah, three times. He says, By Allah, three times. A person is not a believer if they go to sleep with their stomachs full and their neighbors are starving. Not their Muslim neighbors, just neighbors. Your neighbor is struggling, your neighbor is starving. And he says, you that individual, you're not a complete Muslim in front of Allah if you're going to just continue living in that manner. This is how important it is. A second thing I want to mention is the complete antithesis or opposite of this. So here you are. MashaAllah, tabarakAllah, you know, we fed people and we look after them. But here's another issue that arises, another problem that arises. You know how when you go to a restaurant and you order food, and sometimes we, we may have a tendency of ordering more than we need? Or what happens to shuyukh a lot? This is such a big problem. And myself, and this is the great thing even about Mufti Mink, we're so, so firm about this. You're not just going to give us anything at any time. 
and we're just going to eat it. You're not going to give us 17 different dishes and we're going to sit there and pick at it and we're done. You're going to give us exactly what we want so that we can finish it right down to the bone. A really, really sad reality is how much, how much in our Muslim culture, Muslims are wasting food. Think about it. Even some of the women that are cooking, you ever notice when you cook a pot of food and then you feed the family and there's still half a pot left? What ends up happening to it? A lot of times it's thrown away. Do you know the ayah thumma la tus'alunna yawma idhin anin na'im? There will come a time where Allah will ask you about all the blessings He gave you. Do you know how that ayah came down? That ayah came down when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was going to sit with Abu Bakr and Umar and the Abu Ayyub al-Ansari roasted, he cooked a sheep and he brought the sheep in front of the three of them. And he said to them, Tafaddalu, go ahead, go ahead and start eating. And the Prophet ﷺ calls his daughter Fatima. And he says, bring Fatima, let her come and enjoy this because she hasn't eaten food like this in a long time. That's when Allah gave him that ayah. Allah gave it to him. You're going to be asked for every blessing that Allah has given you. What did you do with it? How did you survive? How did you, how did you live with this? with this blessing? How did you utilize it? Did you abuse it? And one of the biggest problems is so many Muslims are guilty of abusing food, taking it for granted. And so brothers and sisters, the second thing that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam teaches us is This is what I like to call put your good etiquettes now into action. Put that mentality, that pure sincerity now into action. Let's go on to number three. وَصِلُ arham. Keep family ties together. You know, once there, a while ago, I was standing, I had done a program in our masjid. And you know when we're done, a lot of the audience, they want to come and talk to you, they, have, they want to ask questions and so on. This was in winter time. So I finished my program, I'm about to leave and go outside to my car, and a brother stops me and he says, Sheikh, 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 I want to talk to you. So I said, okay, Akhi, is this something quick? He said, yeah, 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 quick, quick, quick. So he started giving me his whole biography of his entire life. You know, where he came from and even he told me some, uh, something about the foods that he likes and he doesn't like. I don't know where he was going with this question. So he kept going, going, and I had to interrupt him three, four times. Akhi, get to your question, get to your question, get to your question. And then I saw there was a woman she was holding a baby, and then she had another child beside her. She was waiting at a corner. So after about 20 minutes, this brother still hasn't gotten to his question, but about 20 minutes, I interrupted and I said, brother, um, I need you to get to your question because I think that sister is waiting to talk to me as well. And he looked back and he said, no, 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 Sheikh, that's my wife. It's okay, they can wait. What did the Prophet Sallallahu say? Khayrukum, khayrukum li ahli. The best of you are those who are the best to their families. Then there was another hadith. The best of you are those who are best to their wives. And I am the best to my wives. This is the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam telling us. The best of you are those who are the best to their wife. So I looked at him and I said, she's standing there waiting for you to finish or does she want to talk to me so he says no 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 she's just waiting until i'm done but sheikh i really got to tell you all of this before i get to my question i got so upset and i told the brother here's my card email me salam alaikum i said to him later on few days i think later on I'm in the masjid, he comes up to me, yeah, Sheikh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I think I upset you, I don't know what happened. I said, yeah, Akhi, the Prophet says the best of you are those who are best to their family. You have to treat your wife and your family better than you treat shuyukh. You have to treat them better than you would treat Abu Bakr and Umar. You have to treat them better than anybody else on the face of this earth. Why would you keep her waiting for 20 minutes and you just sit there conversating with me? If you have a quick question, give it to me. Otherwise, get her in the comfort of your vehicle and go home. It was a long night. That's why I got upset. I just gave it to him the way I wanted to give it to him. 
I had to just stick to what I know was right. And so, brothers and sisters, with that kind of mentality, let me ask you, if we take our families that seriously, we make sure that we fulfill all our rights with them, we provide for them, we protect them. Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O people of Iman, qu anfusakum, protect yourself, wa ahlikum nara, and your families from the fire. So don't make the mistake of putting on like a Bollywood movie and you bring the whole family together and be like, okay, let's watch like, I don't know, Kuch Kuch Hotai or something like that. You're just sitting there and you're watching this movie. You know, I can't understand when it comes to these, these like Bollywood movies, I can't understand what's the entertainment in watching somebody who is on a boat in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean singing to his girl of his dreams who is somewhere in the depth of India and she can actually hear him singing and then she sings back to him then the next scene they both meet at a tree and they make tawaf around this tree like 14 times singing to each other and, that's, and the whole movie just continues then she's, on, she's in a helicopter somewhere he's in the slums somewhere and they're still singing to one another it's like come on just get married and in the movie or something subhanallah but here's the idea now you're allowing yourself but especially your children to watch this especially your children to watch this don't be surprised that one day your child wakes up one day at 15 16 or 17 years old your child says you know mom I finished um, my, the Quran dad I have a job now I'm good but there's one thing I like a girl as a matter of fact dad I have a girlfriend I've had a girlfriend for the last three years and you didn't know anything and then the parents go into the state of shock how could this happen my son who's a half of Al-Quran here's the thing you can never forget you know you can teach your children as much Islam in the world as possible you cannot forget that they are also human beings they are creatures with feelings so they can memorize the Quran and do all of that good stuff but they will still come to you dad I like a girl but I finished Surah Al-Baqarah today they can still do that dad I finished Taraweeh but when I was coming outside of the masjid I saw a mashaAllah tabarakallah walking by mm. They have feelings. What are you going to do with that? What kind of conversations are you going to have with that? How are you going to keep those things together? This is the problem. There are so many parents that are guilty of telling their children, no, 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 no. She's not a girl, son. She's a shaitan. Make dua. Go pray two rakats. That was shaitan you saw that was wearing that hijab. Yeah. You're not going to solve the problem. Because even if he goes and he prays two rakats, guess what? Dad, I still like her. As a matter of fact, I was thinking about her in Salah. So it's not working. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. You want to get through the kids? Kul anfusakum. Look at the mirror. Look in the mirror and see what you see. Then you'll see a mini version in your children. That's going to be the secret ingredient. That's your secret weapon to getting through to children. Is to be a strong example for your kids. What you want to see in them, they have to see it in you. I want to leave you or at least give you sort of a, a method to follow in our Sharia. Kids when they are raised by parents, they go through three stages. The first stage of when there are infants and babies to around you know 10 or 12 years old so that baby stage that's the stage of approval so if you're writing this down I want you to write down that between that age group that is the stage of approval that's the stage when your child comes up to you and they say daddy 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 and you're engrossed in your work the mom is you know she's busy with her thing mommy 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 daddy 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 mommy 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 and they keep going back and forth and they won't leave you leave you leave you so finally one of you gives them attention so the dad says yes what do you want doubles what do you want answer me and the child looks at you and does this <laughs> that's it or they show you a piece of paper and all they did is they drew a big blue dot 
and he says, look, Daddy, this is you. That's it. If you don't know how to handle that properly and say to them, here's the mistake that parents do. They say to their kids at that stage, that's what you called me for? I'm busy here at work. I'm on the phone. I'm watching TV. I'm tired. I've been to work all day. Go to your mother. You see, I pick on the men a lot with this because we have to be taught how to be affectionate and caring to our children. We have to be taught that. A woman, on the other hand, is born with that. That's why Allah Azza wa Jal instilled within her that when she has a child, she doesn't, doesn't matter what happens. She is going through life and death delivering a child, and that child could, you know, poop on her clothing, spray her, kick inside her stomach, take away all her food and vitamins, take away all, everything that you don't have to pay rent when you're in her stomach, you don't have to go do groceries, nothing. And still the mother will say, oh, mommy loves you. The father would be like, oh my God, go to your mother. Because we have to be taught how to have that affection. We have to be, that's why even you can see it all the time. A woman falls in love with her baby, the moment she finds she's pregnant. The moment she finds out she's like, I'm in love with it. Men, after the child is born, three months later, they're sitting with the other friends and so on, be like, Ahi, I can't believe I'm a, I'm a father, you know. My child is now three years old, I can't believe he's actually mine. <laughs> you're still figuring it out, you're still trying to convince your brain that this is it. So the point is, brothers and sisters, when we talk about keeping family ties together, the secret to doing that is to have the affectionate and love and open communication with your family. So the first stage is the stage of approval. Then the second stage of raising children is what? That's the teenager stage. Some of you that hear that word teenager, the ayah that comes to mind for you is inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Because that is a, that's the roughest stage. They can either lose all of their iman or that is the stage of their life where they preserve their Islamic identity. Let me tell you the secret to getting through teenagers. Friendship, friendship, friendship. Be their friend. How do you become a friend with a teenager? Communication, communication, communication. How do you communicate with, their, with a teenager? You come down to their level. You speak their language. You know, one thing that I like about all of you Trinidadians, right? Is if you haven't heard me speak the Trinidadian accent, a lot of you tell me that I'm pretty good at it. And I think that I kind of got most of it down, except some of you guys, when you talk, I, I really do need a translator. It's really, really important for me to understand the melody in your voice is a whole different level but for the most part all of you I can understand well and I can also respond in the same tone as well that's not for me just something fun it's something that I am very proud of within myself that I can be amongst you and just be one of you I just want to be like you. I want to be amongst you. That attitude you have to take with teenagers. You can't make teenagers feel like furniture that are just pushed around in the house. You can't talk to teenagers like they have no feelings. Go to your room, clean this, go help your mother, take out the garbage, wash, the dry, wash my car, go do this. Salamu alaikum, wake up. And you can't just give them this kind of relationship because it doesn't work, it breaks teenagers. If you don't have open communication with your family, with your children, then there's a good chance your children are communicating with somebody else. They'll just go find new parents on Facebook. They'll go find new parents on Instagram. And then you start to lose them. وَصِلُوا arham Keep strong and family ties with each other. And the last stage in raising children is after the teenage years. So we're at about 20 years old and above. This is the stage of support. So you've communicated with them. Now they want to choose a career path. They want to go to university, college. They want to start building their life. They come to you and they say, Dad, I want to get married. 
Mom, I see somebody, I see a good brother, I want to get married, you know, can you help me with this? They want your support now, now you got to look out for them. Now you got to start to piece together their life so that you can let them go on their own to become independent and survive. Then when you're done that stage of support, then guess what happens, parents, for all of you? Now you can sit back and relax because your children will take care of you. So now you can enjoy the rewards the rewards and the benefits of your effort of raising children you know subhanallah raising kids is not easy it is probably one of the most difficult things a human being will ever go through is raising another human being it is so hard that's why Allah calls fitna. Allah says that in the Quran your wealth and your money and your children they are a fitna they're a trial for you in this world it's not easy man their emotions, their problems, their friends, their habits, their thoughts, everything is always a subject of discussion and issue in your life. It's not easy. But the way that you get through this is you have to, have to open the door of communication and be able to talk their language, speak their language. So, I'm going to give you one piece of homework. Raise your hands if you have Facebook. As a matter of fact, raise your hands if you don't have Facebook. If you don't have Facebook. La ilaha illallah. <laughs> Quite a few of you don't have Facebook. My goodness, where have you been? If you don't have Facebook, here's one piece of homework that I'm going to give you. Tonight, and especially if you have children. So this homework is especially for those who have children. So the parents who have children and you don't have it, this is for you. Go home and open a Facebook account and send a friend request to your child. Or poke them. <laughs> if you don't know what I'm talking about, this has nothing to do with violence, okay? Poke your child or send them a face re Facebook request. And if you see a picture of your kid on Facebook wearing niqab, but they don't wear hijab in real life, then understand that that is your first clue. Your child is hiding things from you. It's a fake image. Your child does not want you to see who their real parents and who their real friends are. So they'll make up this fake account, go to Google Images, put like a niqabi picture, and be like, yeah, dad, it's me. I love you too. I'm so happy you're here. But you're the only friend on their list. So it's just you two communicating. This is going to be your first clue. Get to their level. This is my point. Speak their language. Communicate with them in their language. Don't give them iPads and that's like, go, 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 go. And leave them alone. So every time they go through a driveway, every time they go to a mall and a store, they got to get connected to Wi-Fi right away. That becomes their whole world. And you become nothing. You become their outer space. Wasilul Arham. Keep family ties together. The last and final portion of this hadith that I leave you with, it, brothers and sisters, is our messenger alayhi salatu wasalam is telling these people. He's telling them. So the third category is to keep family ties together. I want to summarize that and say that a community is only as strong as the families that build that community. If you want a strong family, then a strong community, then you need to build strong families. I am so tired of going to one country to another, to one community to another, that is so focused on building masajids that they're forgetting to build people. So focused on building masajid, one after another after another. And the people become absolutely useless. They can't function. They're still divorced. They're still bankruptcies in people's homes. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us strength. Allahumma ameen. Wasallu bilayl wa nasu niyam. Pray during the nights. Pray during the nights while people are asleep. Tahajjud. Tahajjud. Want to hear the secret about tahajjud? Tahajjud equals happiness. There is no such thing as somebody who prays Qiyamul Layl and is not content in their life. It doesn't, they can't exist. That you're not content but you're praying to Hajjud. It doesn't happen. Secondly, 
Remember I, the hadith started off where this rabbi attested that when he saw the Prophet Sallallahu face, he said that this man can never be a liar. Did the Prophet Sallallahu pray to Hajjud? Absolutely. Allah told him, Qumi layla illa qalila. Stand up in the night even if it's just a portion. Stand up in the night. The Prophet Sallallahu his face was like a full moon. And now the hadith ends off with the night prayer. So piece it together. If you want Allah to put barakah, if you want Allah to bless you, to give you light of iman in your face, one of the ways you'll preserve it and increase it is through qiyamul layl. Look at the person's face who's praying to Hajjud and tell me what you see. I'll bet you that if you look at that person who's praying to Hajjud, I'll bet you that you will only see a sense of peace and love in that individual, something beautiful about them. Have you ever met somebody like that? Have you ever met somebody when you look at them, you're just like, wow, mashallah, man. I can see like nur or something on your face, some kind of light, something very comforting about you. I just see it, it's there. This is what tahajjud gives you. And so the messenger, alayhi salatu was salam, starts off with the salam, the icebreaker, the door towards good etiquette. Then number two, feed the need, feed the people who are in need. Make sure that everybody is comfortable. So you're putting your good etiquettes into action. Then number three, especially with your family. Don't go and help a community if you can't help your family. Then number four, don't forget the hereafter. Because life can be very, very consuming. You're always, always consumed with so much in your life that sometimes you lose sight of the real and more important thing, which is the hereafter. And the way that you keep that intact is keep praying, especially even in the night. May Allah Azza wa Jal bless us and keep us consistent during our night prayers. Allahumma ameen. My brothers and sisters, I want to conclude and say to all of you, with these four things, look what our Prophet Sallallahu says. You do these four things, Tadkhulul Jannata bis salam. You enter Jannah with salam, with peace, with security. In other words, you secure your place in Allah's Jannah. You secure your spot in Jannah. So, the audience shouted out to me, what is number one in the hadith? The salam. What is number two in the hadith? Feed those who are in need. What is number three in the hadith? Keep family ties strong. And number four, the night prayer. You do these four things, and inshallah, Allah says, or the Prophet ﷺ says, you will have a secure place in Jannah. You know what's amazing to me? Wallahu yad'u ila daris salam. Allah even says in the Quran that He calls you to the place of salam. Where is this place? Udkhuluha bi salam. It's the place that we hope we can enter with peace and salam. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's Jannah. Allah calls Jannah one of its names. It is the place of peace because nobody in paradise will worry about anything. There won't be any troubles. There won't be any stress. There won't be any problems. It is a place of complete security and peace. No issues for anything in your life. All of that will disappear. Allah Azzawajal calls himself as salam and he is the source of peace. And so ayyuhal ahbab, I want to conclude and say from my heart to all of you listening that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shower us with peace and security. Say ameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enter us, all of us, in Darus Salam, in the place of peace in the hereafter. Say Ameen. And brothers and sisters here in Trinidad, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep you all under His security and peace. Allahumma Ameen. Wallahi, it is such a privilege for me to come here and visit you once and twice a year. It is such a privilege and such an honor. And I promise you the doubles have nothing to do with that. It is really my heart to 
that is attached to all of you. I cannot wait, I cannot wait insha'Allah ta'ala for the opportunity. I want to meet every single one of you as much as possible for the rest of the evening. So please don't be shy, let's talk, let's connect, and let's do what I conclude with. Jazakumullahu khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.